Okay, uh, we've had one talk which in a certain sense is driven by uh, the pursuit currently of academic understanding, say, of the cardiac system and the complexities of it. Then we had a talk which was about use of large-scale resources in support of scientific endeavours. And my talk is going to be focused mainly on an area which is uh, adumbrated a little by previous comments about the molecular end of personalised medicine and the way in which we can try to help uh, with what I called earlier actionable decisions. So if we're able to do our science rapidly, accurately, precisely and reproducibly, we have something that starts to be credible from the point of view of taking decisions. And that decision making in science goes back to the ability to predict things and then act on them. I mean, the paradigm case that everyone is familiar with is the weather. Weather forecasting is in this category. We usually believe short-term weather forecasts, and if you're thinking about how those are run, they're run with large-scale computers controlled by meteorological offices and typically associated with government labs, and there's a security issue around them as well. But our idea is, I want to know tomorrow's weather today uh, for the reason that I can then decide whether to bring an umbrella into work. And in the context of clinical decision making, it's totally analogous. I want to be able to make a decision that's eventually going to be approved by regulatory authorities so someone who's clinically trained can take a decision based on that. So I need to be able to do all of the things I mentioned earlier. And then I can transfer the technology. We're not really there yet, but people are now in things like the FDA already talking about how we implement computational methodologies in, you know, for example, clinical trials. So there's a lot at stake here. That's the clinical end, but there's this other end with industry, and a big target there is pharmaceutical companies. And what's the problem with pharmaceutical companies? Uh, I mean, I heard today that, uh, um, um, well, I think it was today, you know, it, uh, several of them report quarterly earnings, and sometimes it sounds fine and dandy uh, that they're making uh, good, uh, regular, uh, three monthly returns and so on for, the, for, the, for, the, for their uh, stockholders and so on. But the fundamental issue is the problem that it takes on average 10 years and $2.5 billion to make a single drug. And uh, we now live in a post genomic era where we have projects like the 100,000 Genomes Project in the UK, sequencing the hell out of everyone, and we're told, as I mentioned earlier, there's something called personalised medicine. We're not after a blockbuster, though a pharmaceutical company may find that attractive. We're supposed to believe that we can make lots of individual drugs, so we might call them niche busters. And how are we going to go from a model that takes 10 or 12 years to produce one single drug to a picture where we can produce many of them? I submit to you that the current methodology that's used in that industry needs to be changed. And one way it will be changed is through technology of the kind we're discussing today that can produce actionable decisions fast enough to direct experimental work because the laboratory work and the clinical trials are extremely expensive and time consuming. That puts a challenge out for that industry to step up to the plate in using the technology. So our interest in the science lead us to devise methods that are in those categories of reproducibility, fast and accurate. And then the question is, who's going to pick up these methods? And they're not going to be picked up in academic settings using open computing systems, which is why we have to worry about the combination of high performance computing in a public framework to develop methods and then see how they might be picked up. And that involves interactions with clouds. <coughs> So I want to quickly acknowledge people, because I tend to forget this at the end of a talk, there's a whole range of people who are behind the work that's going on here, and it's an injustice to only list certain of the names, but currently what I'll talk about involves active collaborations with a couple of uh, pharma companies. You've seen some of the logos there already, to do with LRZ, Archer, the Heart Tree Centre, which was set up a few years ago by the government in order to try and address the needs of industry to use high performance computing, and we'll see how that works in the context of all of this work. But at the top, we've also got a bunch of these people in cloud provision, and the question there is, can they 
uh, help to use these technologies in, in a uh, pressing sense from, a, from an industrial perspective. So that's a bunch of uh, things that I needed to mention. The science behind this case, which was deployed on Supermuc, for example, in that so-called heroic effort, is about trying to make binding energy predictions. And I know Herman von Kleinman here will talk about that specifically, and what uh, Janssen's interests are. This is becoming very interesting because it is in the category of, I think I know how to reliably predict these things now. And historically, in the context of most pharmaceutical companies, they don't pay attention to this stuff. They listen to your explanation after they've discovered their, their candidate drugs. So we're trying to change that. And one of the ways we do it is by using very high-end uh, computing to get our answers on an actionable time scale. This revolves around, in the instance of our work, something we call a binding affinity calculator. It's emphatically a work. It has a concatenation of a large number of steps, some of which are low compute, others are high intensity. And we have to run that work through, flow fast enough to get decisions that are tomorrow's weather today, not in three weeks' time. Because tomorrow's weather in three weeks' time, might I say, is of academic interest. It doesn't mean it's not interesting, because in three weeks I could look at what the prediction for tomorrow was and I'd see whether it was any good, and I might need to change my algorithm. But it's lost, let's say, 99% of the people who are interested in the decision when it's taken on a, a, a rapid time scale. So how do we step up to do this stuff? I want to talk to you about it, and I want to show you how you can deploy this potentially in a cloud environment as well as on a very large super then the question is, what do you want to do? Is it more research? Do you want to deploy the application in a commercial context? So the big picture here is a black box. In the end, if it was a clinical person, that's our problem. These modeling methods are not understood by conventional medical, medically trained people because they don't technically learn about modeling and simulation. You'd like a black box which just takes a bunch of drug candidates against a uh, protein which is uh, indicated there, and it ranks them according to how tightly they bind, because the binding, is, uh, as Herman will tell us, is quite an important first property to identify for developing lead compounds. So we've actually been working on the automation of this for quite a few years, and the scale at which we can operate depends on the technology and the speed. Okay, so the audience will have a subset of people who know that if this is teaching grandmother to suck eggs, but if you are not in the area of concern, I need to just point out what's at stake scientifically here is being able to do calculations of free energies rapidly, reliably, uh, accurately, and precisely. And that hasn't been the case until very recently. So we just want to calculate a free energy of binding, and I won't go into all the technical details of how this is done, because the talk doesn't allow for that, but there are some methods for doing it. We've been uh, pioneering the way we can do this reliably. Uh, some of them are so-called endpoint methods, so you compute the free energies of the protein and the drug that are the initial ingredients and the, the product, as it were, of the binding has a free energy associated with it as well. Uh, this has been referred to uh, by terrible acronyms, which look absolutely appalling, but uh, one runs uh, full all atom molecular dynamic simulations and applies certain uh, algorithms to analyze the trajectories. Some of them are based around the assumption of a continuum solvent here and revolve around a so called Poisson Boltzmann uh, surface area approximation. Now, uh, historically, people would just run one of these molecular dynamic simulations, and the literature is replete with such simulations. And uh, there is a, a difficulty with them, but I want to quickly just mention an alternative aspect, which in a computer is entirely plausible, though not in a laboratory, because we believe alchemy died out uh, maybe a thousand years or so ago. You're calculating free energies, it's a function of state. So if I can cut it, it, I can calculate a difference in free energies by going around a so-called thermodynamic cycle. If you're an experimentalist, you have to do it in real space. But if you're in a computer, you can go around in alchemical space. So you just 
alchemically change, in this instance, the green ligand from one compound into another, and it turns out, as they say, that then you can calculate the difference, that's the relative free energy for the two drugs in that protein, quite efficiently, but still with computational demands, which are non-trivial. Historically, one simulation was more than enough. So I just remind you, in line with what Dieter said at the beginning of the millennium, the UK's national supercomputer, Andy, you may have been in Manchester at the time, CESAR, had 512 cores on it, uh, an SGI origin, I seem to remember. 512 cores, you might run one MD simulation once. Look what happens if you run it many times. This is just a message without going into the detail. It's really uh, a recognition that molecular dynamics is nothing more than a stochastic process. It has Gaussian statistics associated with it. That means there's an incredible sensitivity to the initial conditions. So you run one simulation. The next person who comes up will run, get a different answer. Unless you somehow conspire with your software to, to be so clever that any time someone submits a job, they run from exactly the same seed as you did. But that's not realistic. And the reason for that is related to a, pro a property of dynamics that's simply not been understood modern, in modern terms. If you're going to have a system that goes to equilibrium, the individual trajectories that make up the equilibrium description, which is probabilistic, must have a chaotic nature. That means any trajectory, no matter how close to a neighbouring one, will diverge exponentially fast. And so you can't possibly think you're going to predict the property of the long-term system from a single state, because that state will always be an approximation to the true state of the system. And I just suggest for a minute, if we know anything about the initial conditions and the numerics of them, any real system will be overwhelmingly in an initial condition which is non-computable, it will be in the set of irrationals. But any computable number is in the class of zero measure. Maybe uh, it's, it's a computable number and finite representation. So you have a problem there, and the only way to deal with it is through appealing to statistical mechanics in the way you should. You run ensembles and you compute the average properties directly. Most people would argue you just run one long simulation. If you run it for long enough, you compute the time average. But the time average is only equal to the ensemble average in the limit where the time is infinite, and that infinite time would have to be of the order of a primary occurrence time, which is infinitely longer than the lifetime of the universe. So it's not really a sensible thing to do, though almost every paper I read in molecular dynamics does it. Anyway, we do it this way, you find a gazillion answers, but it's just like weather forecasting. Run enough of them, n replicas, such that if I run n plus 1, the error doesn't change. What is n? There's no theory which tells us that. But the answer turns out to be manageable on these supercomputers. So this is what happened if you ran one simulation. You don't know what the errors are because they're out of your control, but after you've done the work we do, you know these errors are huge. So your predictions have no discriminatory value whatsoever. I want to reduce the error bars, and that's what I can do if I run ensembles with differing initial conditions. They differ only in the choice, as it were, from the Gaussian distribution of velocities. Each velocity component for every atom is chosen from a random scene, drawn from a, a, a Gaussian distribution. So if my model has 40,000 atoms in it, it might do. Three times that number of random numbers have to be generated as the initial condition, and then it goes off. And it goes off in many different directions. But that's the beauty of it. I'm now sampling a huge amount of place space. So the methods that we have are based on running ensembles, and they are beautiful for current machines, multi-core machines. To coin a phrase, our high performance computers are not getting faster, they're getting fatter. This is a ba basic problem of the human condition in the Western world. But because they're getting fatter, we can run many jobs at once. And in the time we do one, we do the whole goddamn lot. So I now need maybe 10,000 cores, and I get everything out, reliably with error bars. 
I can do it in a few hours. And the issue then is, uh, what can I do with these calculations? So one of the techniques, which is the endpoint method, has diversity in the types of molecules I can look at. Uh, they're not restricted by um, approximations that actually do dog us in the exact alchemical methods. They're exact, but actually only apply in a perturbative sense, and they're not reliable when charges change on the molecules. But the foundations of this are deep and light in our understanding of uh, dynamics of, of complex uh, classical systems. So actually the protocol that you need has to run a large number of these replicas. How many you choose in the end is a question. If you're paying for it, how much can you afford? You pay to reduce the error parts. And you can pay if you care about that, or if it's not so important, you run less of them. But you vary the initial conditions, you collect all the trajectory data, it's a lot, and then you compute. So this comes down to the mapping of the science and the challenge onto the architecture of your machine. And that's an example of the kind of workflow we have. You prepare the model, and then you develop enough replicas, which, which are then just fed into your supercomputer, or cloud, as we'll come on to. You run through a so-called equilibration phase, and then the production, when you think you're in the equilibrium state, collecting the data up to the period you need. So I've just got indica indicative numbers of what amounts of data you're accumulating, the number of cores per in, a sort of job here in cloud terminology, maybe the sort of instance that you're running, how long it takes. And if you just tot up those numbers at the moment there, it's a few hours. I can get the answers, if I do this correctly, within four or five hours. And then you can play games with uh, the exact nature of the hardware. I might have some accelerators that I'm interested in. How quickly can I get the answer? So roughly speaking, a few hours here. That's actionable for a laboratory decision that might suggest people to do something. It's also actionable for a clinician who'd like to know the answer for a particular drug. Let's say in the HIV protease case, there are nine FDA approved drugs. Which one am I going to give to the patient who presents? Well, if you use big data methods, you'd regress against the data for everyone who's ever been seen previously and try to suggest this looks like that. That's statistical inference, and it's pretty powerful, but it's limited. Personalized medicine means I'm dealing with data for you, not extrapolation or interpolation from the data on others. So the TIES method is similar to the ESMAX method. These things just parallelize beautifully on supercomputers. And you can, again, get accurate results within uh, a few hours. Here. So then you have to design user-friendly front ends to facilitate potentially anyone or different kinds of people using this stuff. And the workflow that helps to do that has a user-friendly client. We've designed this thing so that actually you could submit your jobs to any of a range of resources. They could be conventional HPC, local, remote, or a commercial cloud. And the back manages this. So the picture of how you set up this is vaguely like that, with the resource could be HPC or cloud to run the, the production and then feeding off analysis to the results. These are the type of machines we've been using from the HPC end. You've heard quite a few things about them. I don't need to dwell on them. You'll recognize many of the names. Some of them are GPU accelerated, others are not. And there's the story about Supermook. We've heard about that. If you want to deploy this on an HPC uh, environment and go into the very large end of this game, where the cores are getting to millions to tens of millions and beyond as we move to the exascale, we actually find that definitions of, uh, in the, say, open API standard, aren't suitable enough to run this type of computation. That standard is now having to be adjusted to accommodate these calculations. But you can imagine that this is a highly scalable environment to deploy all these things. So one of the uh, plots that people like to display are benchmarks. And I'm just showing you some amusing benchmarks for performance of these codes on different architectures. If you work in a cottage industry and you run with a small amount of GPUs, 
the story is the GPU is much better than a, than a multi-core machine. And that may well be true, but the picture is blurred when you have access to very large resources. So for those who care about this, there are some in the audience, the metric that matters is how many nanoseconds can I get per day out of my architecture? And just look at those things. Cartesian his state as a GPU enabled machine. I said it's in the top 500. I can generate about 100 nanoseconds per day from that. And Cartesius in the Netherlands doesn't do particularly well for NAMD because even when I throw more nodes at it, it doesn't speed up very much. Maybe it's getting through 50 nanoseconds per day. But if I run on the supermodel, actually Archer is the same as Gavin might be interested to know. If I throw enough nodes at my problem, I can run these things substantially faster. So please don't tell me I can't run my application faster on a multi-core machine than I can on a GPU where my economics is concerned. It simply depends on how many nodes you throw at the problem, how much your budget is, and all the other issues. And this, this is actually for Romax, because that application was NAMD. Everyone what has their favorite MD application and, and, and Romax which some people say is the fastest code in the West and all the rest of it doesn't do particularly well on some of these platforms compared with NAMD, it does better on others. The picture is different. Cartesius, it does better because it's a Dutch code and Cartesius, you'd expect, they've spent a bit more time optimizing the deployment there. So the commercial cloud thing is the alternative to running on these machines. You pay, as it were, for the service someone else delivers it. Either you get access to the hardware, memory and storage, or what's more common really is software as a service. The end user doesn't need to worry about all this infrastructure, they just submit jobs to something that runs and produces the results. So for us, we have applications of this binary ability now on the AWS uh, Invert Cloud. We're talking, we also have something with DNA Nexus, who provide a cloud environment, and I think we may hear more about that later and currently looking with Microsoft at deployment on their high-performance computing system. This is just an architecture diagram. The difference of, in the structure of the back when it runs, for example, on the Amazon uh, cloud rather than on the HPC service that I put up rapidly before. Uh, if you're dealing with cloud scaling, what does it look like? Well, there's the sort of plot number of nanoseconds per day, again, number of cores. The number of cores is embarrassingly small here. It's in the tens. I was showing you ones which run up to thousands before, but that's the size of the unit of parallelism on an AWS cloud, right? They don't care particularly about distributed, you know, long-range tight interconnects. The most parallelism you'll get is what you get on a node, and it might be 32 cores, or it might be 128. Many of our applications will run happily on those, but they won't run as fast as if I had more cores available. Or the interconnects were faster, etc. So that's just showing you, you know, maybe I can get seven nanoseconds a day there. And what could I get on a GPU in this? That's showing you what I can get there with GPUs from uh, AWS. 20 nanoseconds with the uh, two extra viewers. So these are things that you care about if you want your answers in a hurry. How much are you going to pay? Where are you going to deploy? And then the, the interesting thing I mentioned with uh, Microsoft Azure, this is an HPC cloud in the sense that it has InfiniBand interconnects between these nodes, so it's got the possibility to support larger scale HPC applications in the sort of area we're interested in. So you can get some benchmarks in this case, these were actually reported on my behalf by Kenji and his colleagues uh, in the Microsoft Azure research team ahead of the presentation I gave at the American Chemical Society on the 2nd of April. These show what you can get on that platform. They haven't yet deployed the GPU case, but we will have some figures for that shortly. So then the question is, where do you put your investment? If you're a an academic at this point in time, such as ourselves in our work, we're actually enjoying the ability to deploy on very large computers, and uh, we could always run there. But you have some limitations to that model, because 
uh, Dieter was effectively saying that though he didn't spell it out, it's an issue that's close to his heart as well as mine, the model in the supercomputer center is go to the end of the queue. In other words, batch queues rule okay. I submit my job and I wait my time, turn in the queue. Well, I just told you a few minutes ago that these applications depend on being run in a timely fashion. So you're going to be thwarted by those facilities for as long as they are in that fashion. And that's where clouds are potentially attractive to people because in principle, as we say, you pay your money and you take your choice, you pay for a service where you expect to run the thing on demand. So you can get the thing to run. And potentially, if the cloud is elastic, at scale that suits these applications. So that's interesting. The question then becomes one of cost. Who's going to pay the ferryman? Again, as an academic, we tend not to look at the money. Some academics use the cloud. It's the lower end of this business where it's a few hundred to thousands of dollars to run some jobs. But at the scale of these type of applications, it costs significant money. And the question is, how much money is it worth deploying in these environments? Is it worth setting up your own high-performance computing machine? Is a facility like the Hartree Center that has HPC but geared to industry sufficient to meet the needs? These are all questions that are worth looking at. What we could say here is, uh, in the cloud environment, you do tend to be heavily on your own, needing to do a lot of installation with your own stuff. But if you've got the experts, you can run. So I think I've just given you a quick overview of a number of aspects to this type of application. They're kind of very real in the sense that there are people in this community, in the audience, who are trying to figure out what scale of high performance computing and in what manner they want to use it. And the issues are, uh, as I said here, to do with um, the balance between your own investments uh, locally in your machine and ones where you would uh, run by outsourcing. And that, that's part of a, a hot discussion that I'm happy to facilitate here. So with that, I'll stop and thank you for your attention.